Now stay tuned for a short film titled Next Year Country. of an energy-hungry nation are turning west. Beneath these wide-open spaces lies the greatest remaining storehouse of energy and mineral wealth in the United States. There are fortunes to be made here, and men are moving mountains and stripping cropland in a rush to develop these valuable resources. The cumulative effects of these developments are changing the face of the west and the lives of the people who live here. The problems which the West now faces are not limited to this region, but are shared by the entire nation. These communities speak for small towns across the country which are confronted with industrial development. On the opposite edge of the Fort Union coal deposit lies Circle, Montana, population 900. Industry has expressed interest in over 500 square miles of the county's lignite reserves. Two companies are conducting feasibility studies for strip mines and synthetic fuel plants in the area. No ground has yet been broken, but the possibility of massive industrialization has made the long-established way of life here suddenly vulnerable. Got to have a pretty good banker to get by very many of these years in a row. We always kind of look forward to the next year anyway. It's kind of a next year country around here. You, you think it might be better the next year. Not much that goes on in Circle escapes Sheriff Bob Jensen. Some days you don't do anything. Other days you go fishing, like I say. Usually what it amounts to in a job like this is the quiet days are you're paid for being available and the busy days are paid for running your legs off, but primarily in a small community, a sheriff is about everything from dog catcher to, to uh, paramedic. You might be out on an emergency call, you might be trying to catch the dog. The one thing you got is no matter who makes a complaint, they figure they're the first one that made one. Everybody to a point is interrelated in business and work and pleasure, and everything runs together. You don't do business with a grocer because he's a guy that sells the groceries, you know the man. You expect him to treat you good and in turn you treat him good. I know probably 90% of the people that would be in this town at any one time. I have a fairly decent idea whether what they tell me is truthful or not, because I probably not only know them, I might know their children, probably knew their folks, so forth. three generations, the people of Circle have established relationships, interdependencies with one another. Here is the fabric of a human culture, what it is to live in relative isolation, dependent on the rhythms of land and weather. These people have a history they are proud of, a network of shared experience and tradition. Square while you're here in the 
Many local residents fear that Circle won't keep going much longer. They feel they need something to stabilize the ups and downs of an agricultural economy. We need some development of some type to uh, create some employment for our younger people and for some of the people that are here. The whole what would you like to see happen? Some type of development, whether it be coal or coal, oil. Oil? Something. We need a shot in the arm. Something really. to boost the economy of this town. It's, it's dying. Circle's predicament is a familiar one for small towns throughout the West. No one would argue that it could use a shot in the arm. Some people think the only solution to Circle's problems is a large-scale industrial development by an outside corporation. Pro-development voices in the community have organized the People for Economic Progress, and rancher David Caston is their president. The opinion of PEP, I guess you would say, is we are looking and hoping to uh, attract some energy development or some other industries to this area so that our... Uh, seniors and that graduate out of our circle local high school possibly could come back here and make a living and have a place to uh, to build their home at hey we have it neat we're, we're here we have a ranch we've got thousands of acres of land we can live and enjoy if more people come in here and want to enjoy some of it with us we can't stop that i i think uh, we're still in america i think uh, I think the economy of the nation is at stake in this issue because uh, we need the energy that can come out of this area. The development has to be done someplace. The energy is here. I guess we're going to have to have the development here. It's causing a lot of controversy because you've got two groups of people. You've got those opposed and those that aren't. And basically speaking, I suppose you could say it's uh, self-motivated on both sides. Those that don't want it have their reasons, and those that want it probably have reasons also. I won't say they're all good or bad. I would say the biggest reasons for not having a coal development in the community probably are social. In other words, the people don't want to change the lifestyle they live in. And I would say the biggest reason probably that people want it or... Uh, self-motivated on the other hand they either want a cultural improvement or they want an improvement of their own pocketbook I'm sure the outside interests are mostly motivated by greed in 1974 the Burlington Northern Railroad purchased the ranch neighboring Charlie and June Yarger's family farm and announced proposals for a strip mine and synthetic fuels plant. Charlie began to question the nature of these developments and their effect on the entire region. The magnitude of development that's being proposed for this area is something I think people have to understand. It's not just, it's not just isolated little instances, isolated little areas. It's all of eastern Montana, it's western North Dakota, it's northern Wyoming. <coughs> Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, tremendous amounts of acreages, billions of tons of strippable reserves of coal. I can understand the anxiety that people in, in the urban areas must feel when companies are telling them that we have to mine this coal, that we have to develop eastern Montana coal, or they're not going to have any electricity, or they're not going to have any... Uh, gas for their automobiles or oil if we don't produce synthetic natural gas but the thing that we have to realize is the fact that this coal isn't just down there under under nothing that the coal lies under a tremendous amount of very productive agricultural land that produces vast amounts of of cattle and sheep and the best hard red spring wheat that's grown in the world. There's none better. 17% protein, dark northern spring wheat. It's the best in the world.
Gordon and Helen Waller's wheat farm adjoins one of the proposed strip mines and coal plants. For the past six years, Helen Waller has helped organize other concerned community members and has devoted a good portion of her life to studying the implications of massive coal development. She has come to see this as a national problem. I think if we had a national energy policy that would deal effectively and serious, you know, if they were really serious about it, they could put together a program based upon energy efficiency and renewable resources that could, would be a step in the direction of permanently solving the problem we've got. This land that they're wanting us to give up for energy development is now their food source. Either we're going to have it as a, a fuel energy source or we're going to have it as a food energy source because we cannot, we cannot coexist. We can use the waste products from agriculture, such as corn stalks, that aren't normally used right now. And there are many other things in agriculture, many other waste products that can be utilized to produce, to build small, decentralized uh, alcohol plants in various locations of agricultural communities throughout the country. Billings, Montana. In November 1980, President Helen Waller called to order the ninth annual meeting of the Northern Plains Resource Council, a region-wide organization of farmers, ranchers, and townspeople advocating alternatives to highly centralized energy development. What I was saying from, from the very beginning was that, you know, you are proposing some drastic, obviously drastic changes for the lifestyle, for Macon County, for the community, for myself. And before I'm going to say, yeah, I think that's just nifty. What you're proposing is just the greatest thing since sliced bread. You're going to have to answer some questions for me. You're going to have to tell me how many people it's going to bring in. You're going to have to tell me the type of pollution. You're going to have to guarantee me that you're not going to destroy my water and that I'm not, I'm not, and the other ranchers and farmers in this area aren't going to have to pay the cost. I'm not willing to be your guinea pig. How could I pass along uh, a strip mine to my kids? I think that it's my responsibility to at least offer to my children and, and to their children and their children's children the opportunity, the ability to continue to raise food and to live uh, in the type of area that I've had the opportunity to live in and to do what I've had the opportunity to do. How far will you go to fight this battle? until we win. Uh, <laughs> and that's, you know, that's, I think, is the commitment, and that's what I think is, makes us strong, is that that's what we're going to do, is we, we're going to win the fight. What if you lose? We're not going to lose, but if we do, assuming that something drastic would happen and that we would, uh, I would honestly say that, and I would be able to say, and I'd be able to say to my kid, that, you know, I gave it my best shot. As long as our national priorities remain unchanged, as long as there is lignite under these wheat fields, the pressure to develop Circle's coal will not go away. But the questions that Charlie and other ranchers like him are raising may bring a new definition of progress to the West, a definition that includes the preservation of a way of life. Don't put it back. Yeah. Get out of here, doll. Okay, one more. This is a nice, heavy one. Here, I can hold on. That's a heavy one. Don't let him out, Gordy. When you grow up, on a farm and in an agricultural community, you, you develop a, a feeling for the land. And it's something that you just don't want taken away. When you believe in something as strongly as I do farming and what we're doing and the kind of life we have with the kids, um, you don't give up easy. It's something that you know is right and um, 
win or lose, I guess you just, you know, you're in it to the end. You just have to do what you think is right. This has been a special presentation in the humanities. Major funding has been provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities.